And this morning we're going to look together at Genesis, and we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3 together today. If you've got a Bible with you, if you want to follow along, we're going to be Genesis chapter 3, and this is what it says. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and was pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realised that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbirth very severe. With painful labour, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you, and through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow, and you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, from dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat, and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden the cherubim and the flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for your words. We thank you for what is written in it, Lord God. We thank you that it's in your word that we see who you really are. And Lord God, as we come and we open up this scripture together today and we think about the overarching story of the Bible, we pray that you will make your word alive to each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you were here with us last week, You'll know that we've just started a new sermon series which we've called God's Big Picture. It's based on a book by a theologian called Vaughan Roberts and basically we're tracing the overarching story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We talked about the fact that this book 
It's not just a collection of writings written over the course of a couple of thousand years by about 40 different authors, but this book that we come to, hopefully on a daily basis, is a book which is one simple book with one author and one main subject, Jesus Christ. And this book, It's the primary way that God speaks to us. It's in the pages of this book that we hear the very voice of God for ourselves. I wonder how much we place on this book, how much emphasis we place on it for ourselves. And if you were here last week, we kicked off this series by looking at the account of creation together. We focused together on God's perfect pattern for the kingdom. That God's people would live in God's land and enjoy God's blessing. This is the ideal life which God set out from the beginning. That we would be a people who lived in God's rest and enjoyed a perfect relationship with him. Sadly though, that perfect relationship that we talked together about last week didn't last very long. It only took to the third chapter of the book of Genesis for things to begin to unravel. And Genesis chapter 3, what we've just read together, is the sad story about how God's perfect creation was spoiled. And it begins with a talking snake. We read these words in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Did God really say, you must not eat of the tree in the garden? Right at the start of our time together, and at the start of this passage together, it raises a number of questions for us, doesn't it? Who is this snake? Where does this snake come from? Are we really meant to believe in a talking snake? The New Testament, in the book of Revelation, identifies to us that this snake that we read about in Genesis is actually Satan. But the Bible doesn't tell us where he came from. But what we do know is that this snake, this Satan, isn't eternal. Nowhere in scripture do we have the possibility where we see this kind of dualistic cosmic battle going on between good and evil from the beginning. Satan is powerful, but he is not equal to God. God alone is eternal. He is the only one who has ever existed all the time. So the conclusion that we have to come to when we think about this creature that we see in the book of Genesis is that he is indeed a created being. He was part of God's original perfect creation, but he must have rebelled against God. There are a couple of times in the New Testament, in the book of 2 Peter and in the book of Jude, for example, that it talks about a rebellion in the angelic world. But we're not told about that here in Genesis chapter 3. The writer doesn't answer all of our questions. He simply tells us what we need to know. It doesn't actually matter if we know where evil comes from or not. What does matter is that we are aware of its existence. How then should we understand what we have read together in Genesis chapter 3? Is what we have read a myth, just a story, or is what we have read a real account of an actual event which actually happened? Well, the rest of the Bible would assume that what we've read together in Genesis chapter 3 was an actual event which actually happened. Paul, for example, compares Adam, the first created human, and Jesus. So we read these words together in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, Just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all have sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if many died by the trespass of one man, that's what we read about in Genesis chapter 3, how much more does God's grace and God's gift that comes by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? 
Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment that followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in the life through one man, Jesus Christ. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so one act of righteousness, what Jesus did on the cross, resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, many were made righteous. What we see before us in the book of Genesis today, in Genesis chapter 3, is an act of rebellion. Remember last week we spoke about the fact that God, through his word, just his word, created the whole entire universe. Notice from what we've read together in Genesis chapter 3, this is is exactly where Satan attacks. He says, did God really say that? You see, what Satan does is he begins to distort the word of God. You see, God gave the people a command, Adam and Eve a command. This garden is yours. You can have anything you like from it, but except that tree, which is in the middle. Do you see that tree? Don't eat from that tree. If you eat from that tree, you will die. You see, God placed this tree in the garden to give Adam and Eve a choice to live in a perfect relationship with him, or to choose to go their own way. There will be consequences if they did go their own way. And Satan knows this, so what does he do? He he attacks the word of God by asking them the question, did God really say that? By trying to sow a seed of doubt in their mind. But Eve puts him right, and she says, yes, God did say that. We can eat from anything, but we can't eat from that tree, because if we do, we will surely die. But Satan doesn't give up. He says, you're not going to die. God told you this because he knows that if you eat from this tree, you'll be like him. And you'll know the difference between good and evil. And what happens is Satan's tactics work. Eve looks at the tree and she sees that this tree is ripe for eating. The fruit on it looks amazing. So she takes some and she eats it and she gives it to her husband too. But the question that leaves us with is, why is this so terrible? I mean, she's only eaten a piece of fruit. That's hardly the crime of the century, is it? Why has God got so worked up about the fact that she's eaten off this tree? Because it was wrong. Because God told them not to do it. By eating off this tree, it was an act of disobedience towards him. Surely, though, you would ask, knowing the difference between good and evil is a good thing, right? That doesn't seem like a bad thing to know at all. You see, the knowledge of good and evil here in Genesis doesn't simply refer to knowing what is right and what is wrong, but rather it refers to deciding on what is right and what is wrong. So in a sense, what happens here, the sin is not a sin simply of law-breaking, but it's a sin of law-making. They were effectively saying, from now on, God, from this moment on, we're going to set the standards by how we choose to live. We're going to be God of our own life. We're going to set the law. We're going to make the way for ourselves. This is a bid to usurp God's authority and take control for themselves. And you know what? Human beings have been doing this ever since. And the consequences have been disastrous. Remember, last week, if you were with us, we talked about the pattern of the kingdom being defined by a series of perfect relationships. We saw that there was a perfect relationship between God and man. We saw that there was a perfect relationship between man and woman. We saw that there was a perfect relationship between man and creation. But This act of rebellion here in the Garden of Eden leads to all of those perfect relationships being spoiled. The perfect trust and intimacy between Adam and Eve was gone. They made coverings to cover up their nakedness. And it's not long before they start to squabble. 
neither, actually, at this point, wanted to accept responsibility for their own actions. It was like at this moment the battle of the sexes began. You see, God tells w- woman in verse 16, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And what we see is that that loving relationship that they had in Genesis chapter 2 is suddenly replaced by a harsh rule. The relationship between humanity and creation becomes distorted too. You see, from this moment on, God tells them that they're going to struggle to control creation. God says in verses 17 to 18, Because you listened to your wife, he's talking to Adam, and ate the fruit from the tree, which I commanded you not to, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce fawns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. From this moment on, working the land was more than simply sweat and hard labour. The natural world would actually become an enemy to Adam and Eve. And we see it today, don't we, with disastrous natural consequences, whether that's earthquakes and volcanoes and all kinds of things happening around the world. This is a result of what happens here in Genesis chapter 3. But most disastrous of them all for humanity was the fact that after they turned away from God, God would turn away from them in judgment. That warm friendship that we see earlier on in, the, in chapter 2 has been destroyed. And when God draws near, they hide from him. But in his grace, God continues to seek after sinful human beings, calling them back into fellowship with him. But the problem is that by nature, we always run away from God now. Adam is naked and ashamed. His innocence has gone and God judges the guilty just as he said he would. The warning that had been given, you will die if you eat from this tree, is carried out. They were banished from the garden. They were prevented from eating from the tree of life. For a while, they continued to exist physically, but spiritually they were dead. And as a result, ever since the fall, all human beings that have been born have been born with the same predicament, spiritual and physical death. You see, we too are sinners. We too have lived in rebellion against God's rule. And then what we see going forward in the book of Genesis, particularly looking at chapters 4 to 11, is the spread of death which comes as a result of this. So chapter 4, for example, we see the first murder committed in Scripture. We see Cain getting so jealous that his brother Abel had found favour favor with God that he kills him. And as a result, he's sent away for a life of wandering. In Genesis chapter 5, we see the first genealogy appear in Scripture. Human beings obey God's command to be fruitful and multiply, and humans begin to multiply. And what we see is that they're created in the image of God. Adam is created in the likeness of God, so is his son Seth, but that is a marred image now. Human beings now bear the mark of sin in their life as a result, which is passed down from one generation to the next. The early human beings may have lived for many years, but the refrain we see in this passage, in this genealogy, is the same time and time again. Over and over again we read, and then he died, and then he died, and then he died, and then he died. We do all we can, don't we, in this world that we live in now to blunt the reality of death. Particularly in our Western world, we even go as far as trying to avoid mentioning death altogether. But as a result of what we read in Genesis chapter 3, death is something which is unavoidable. It's something which comes to us all. But going further into this account, after a few generations had come and gone, what we see is that sin is still very much prevalent. We read these words in chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of human heart were only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. 
what we go on to see in the early chapters of Genesis is, if you like, a reversal of creation. The flood comes and it causes a terrible destruction. That division between earth and waters that we see on day one of creation is undone. And what we see when the flood comes, if you like, is a return to the chaos which existed before God created the world. But God does preserve one family, and human history does continue. But so does sin and God's righteous response to it. Chapter 11 of Genesis brings us probably to the lowest point that we see in human history up until this point. Humanity, they decide to build a tower for themselves. And this tower is a vivid symbol of the fact that they want to be exalted above God and to create a world which is ultimately independent of him. So God scatters humans across the world and confuses their language. And as a result, human beings come divided against each other as a result too. The perfect kingdom that God created at the beginning is now nothing more than a distant dream. The pattern of the kingdom which we spoke about together last week has been destroyed by sin. The perfect world was destroyed by human rebellion. And in many respects, that's where the Bible could have ended. That is where it could have stopped. There is no reason for God to do anything whatsoever to help us. But the God that we've been singing about today, the God that we're here to worship, is a gracious God who was determined to put things right and to restore the kingdom that we talked about together last week. He continues to rule today and he continues to be on the throne. And that means that there is good news for us as we sit here together today. Because that means... For each and every one of us, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what you have done or how bad your past has been, because God has always pursued human beings. He has always pursued us, the pinnacle of his creation, to the point where he sends his only begotten son into this world, who we read about together in Romans, who is the contrast of this Adam, who was disobedient towards God. Jesus came and he lived in total obedience to his father, just as humanity should have done. And as a result of that, he was the only person who could put things right. And as a result of that, he went to the cross to pay for all the wrong things that we have ever thought, said and done, which the Bible calls sin. He took the punishment upon himself. He went to the grave. He spent three days in the tomb. And then he rose again. You see, the kingdom that God had created was destroyed by our rebellion. The story could have ended. But because of Jesus, the story continues. And today, my challenge for each and every one of us is simply this. We're all like Adam. We have all attempted to live independently of God. But the call of God is to come under his rule once again to recognise who we are and who he is, to see Jesus for what he has done and take hold of that for ourselves. So where are you when it comes to your faith with Jesus? Are you someone who comes to church sporadically? Are you someone who's around the Christian community but you've never really committed your life to him? Are you someone who has come to church all your life because, hey, this is what we do on a Sunday? but you've never accepted him for yourself. The Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. To seek the Lord while he is there to be found and to draw on him while he is near. We're going to see this story unfold even more together over the coming weeks and how the whole picture fits together to this pinnacle that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the good news is, as we've been singing about and as we've been praying about today, Although the kingdom of God was destroyed by sin, we know how the story ends. That God does redeem the whole of the world. I'm going to invite the band to come back up.
And we're going to spend some more time worshipping God together now. So I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able. And let's just open ourselves up to what God might want to say to us today. And as we respond in song, and we're thinking of God's big picture, the story which runs through these pages, my challenge this morning is, what is your story at the moment? And what's going on in your life where you need a touch from God today? You might want to receive prayer for something that we've spoken about today, maybe you're not a Christian and you want to accept Jesus for yourself for the first time, we've got a prayer team that are going to be at the back. But there might be something else going on in your life right now and you're uncertain of the story and how it's going to unfold. And you just need God, someone to pray for you and with you today. Maybe you're looking for a new job, maybe there's a life circumstance which feels like it's crushing you at the moment. Our prayer team, I'm going to ask to go into the back. And if you want to receive prayer this morning for anything as we worship God, our prayer team are going to be available to pray with you. But let's Continue in song worship now, recognizing that he is the Lord.